Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of the spiel for Statistical Society of Australia as people are tickling in. Um, first of all, welcome to the August event. I'd like to start with um, acknowledgement of country. Um, in the spirit of the constellation of um, Statistical Society of Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples today. So welcome to the August event. Um, I'm Amy Tanaka, and I'm one of the 12 council members for the Victorian branch of the Statistical Society of Australia. So if you're not sure about the Statistical Society of Australia, well, um, here are like the contact details. Um, and we have social media presses on Twitter, um, as well as Meetup as well. Um, so uh, I'll put the link on the chat as well. So if you want to click on anything or extract any of the information later on, um, you could do that by looking at the slides itself. Um, now, we also have a t-shirt now, um, which was actually designed by one of our council members. Um, and so if you like, um, please go ahead and do buy them. The, the proceeds from this actually does go to support early career statisticians. Um, now, if you were um, in the July event, we actually had an in-person event. Um, and so that was a first in-person event that we've had since end of, um, 2019 in fact um, so it was it was a great catch up and we were hoping to have this one as in person as well but it proved to be a little bit difficult with the close um, proximity to the lockdown um, now for those people who are not members of the statistical society i just want to tell you some of the benefits if you're part of the member um, ship um, first of all, if you are a Statistical Society of Australia member, you get huge amounts of discount in workshop that Statistical Society of Australia runs. Um, and like in 2020, um, we've already run um, Python, Julia, data visualization, data wrangling, as well as semi-parametric regression with R and virgin control using Git and R Studio as well. So you get those benefits as discounts for workshops. Um, but we also have member only events. Um, in fact, for Victoria branch, um, if you look out in September, we're going to have a member exclusive mentoring event. There are things like fellowship funding support, PhD or master's top up scholarships um, and more. Um, so if you want to check it out, you can look at the link that's provided in the slides. Um, and if you're a student, it's also very affordable because it only costs you $20 per year. So to join, you can go to the link that's provided in the slide itself. So if that is not enough, well, also for those people who are the members of Victorian Branch of Statistical Society of Australia, we actually have also um, a conference and workshop funding with up to $250 for the attendance um, to go to a statistical conference or workshop and it doesn't have to be run by um, Statistical Society of Australia. So to apply for funding you can complete the form um, that's in the slide link um, and also congratulations to those who already got the funding for 2021. So you could be one of them as well. Um, it's a pretty simple form and I encourage you to apply um, and to, in order to attend statistical conferences or workshops. Okay, so here is um, the part, let's, now we have um, our uh, speaker today, um, Diane Clinch, um, and this is what you are all here for today. Um, so Diane Clinch, for those people who don't know, um, is currently the Data Analytics Coordinator uh, with the Indigenous Data Network at the University of Melbourne. His role involves providing digital and geospatial solutions for research work being conducted by the Indigenous Data Network. Um, also, he creates um, the digital infrastructure for storage, transformation, translation of data sets that relate to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, before that, Diane used to work at the Department of Health and Human Services, um, first for Aboriginal health and well-being, um, and at the very end um, for the system intelligence and analytics, um, providing business intelligence and geospatial support. 
Now, for those people who were here a little bit earlier, there was a little bit of a sneak peek to what he was going to present. Um, it looks really exciting. Um, so without further ado, um, please, um, if Darren, you could share your slides um, and proceed. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. Um, really appreciated. Um, and again, thanks for Ben for reaching out to me and um, inviting me to come along and present. Um, so, as um, Annie um, pointed out, um, I came into the University of Melbourne to work for the Indigenous Data Network as the Data Analytics Coordinator. Um, so we currently have um, a couple of projects that we're working on um, across Australia. Um, one of those um, projects is the Aboriginal Family Violence uh, Project or the Alcohol Related Family Violence uh, Project. And we're also working on a community data project as well. So, but I'll get in and explain those a little bit um, as we go along. So we had a bit of a discussion before. I'm, I'm not a very formal presenter. Um, uh, I'm a very much a storyteller. I'm more than happy for people to throw questions and you know answer those questions as we go along. Um, not really my style to make people wait till the end because um, sometimes people see something as a bit interesting and they want to ask a question. So, um, so I'm just going to go through um, a little bit of my background. I'm a buddy my man from Yamaji Country and WA. And when you get, oh, I'm going to show you some maps and some interactive stuff afterwards as well. And I'm going to show you that part where I'm from. And um, you know, we're just talking about we're still in the middle of winter down here and Melbourne, and I'm still not used to it, so I'm still got extra layers of clothing on. Because um, where I'm from, it's a, a lot warmer than down here. I've been in Melbourne for 13 years. Um, when I first came to Melbourne, I worked in the prison system, so I did uh, prisoner um, pre and post release support. So you know, went around to all the prisons in Victoria, case managed Aboriginal people coming out of prison and and helped them establish you know housing, homeless, and, um, you know. Um, accommodation, employment, uh, access to services, those kinds of things. Um, and then after that, I went over to the Department of Health um, and there I worked as a project officer, but I didn't really work so much on policy writing. What I did was really support policy writers understand how do we embed information about data into their writing. Because it's one of the things that I noticed um, was a lot of the times people's reluctance to write about data because they would be unsure whether to use the word prevalence or incidence. Now, unless you go and do epidemi epidemiology, um, it can be a little bit confusing and navigating those areas. And one of the things I've noticed, um, you know, especially following um, Twitter, like half the people I follow on Twitter either do R or GIS, <laughs> and then the other half are Aboriginal academics. And one of the things I do notice a lot, a lot of the stuff that was said on there was the confusion about understanding how to storytell with data. So this um, presentation I'm gonna do is about, you know, um, digital geospatially enhanced ecosystems and particularly ones focused on um, data and evidence that relates to Aboriginal people. So we at the Indigenous Data Network, um, we talk to a lot of people about a thing called Indigenous Data Sovereignty. And going hand in hand with that is Indigenous data governance. So Indigenous data sovereignty, in a nutshell, if you want to know more information, you can look up things like um, Tahu Kukatai is very large volume, um, and it's under the, uh, the term Indigenous data sovereignty. There's quite a few uh, people in Australia that um, are able to talk about this. So if you want to talk to people further, you can talk to uh, people like Kalinda Griffiths, um, who's at the University of New South Wales, incredibly smart. Um, Aboriginal woman who's an epidemiologist as well. Um, there's people like Maggie Walters, um, who's at University of Tasmania. Um, there's also Ray Lovett, who works on a very large um, longitudinal study looking at Aboriginal children. Um, and I think he's also at ANU up there in um, New South Wales. Um, unfortunate for them that they're experiencing what we went through last year. And you know, my heart goes out to all those fellows up there. So, when I use the term data democracy, what am I, what am I really referring to? Um, look, way, 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 way back, um, when I was in high school, um, in my second last year of school, they sent me off for um, uh, work experience, and I went to the Department of Environment and Planning, and all I did for two weeks was digitise aerial photographs 
then I got to stitch them together on a computer. Um, and then I got to plot them out on a massive big plotter. And I was happy as a pig in the proverbial, if you know what I mean. And I was hooked on GIS from that moment onwards. <laughs> now, one thing I've noticed over time is that I've got more, as I got more and more into this area and into data and data management, data structures, data ecosystems, those kinds of things, GIS, data visualization, business intelligence, those kinds of things, the lack of Aboriginal people involved in those spaces means that for a very, very long time, and even now, Aboriginal people don't really control or have a say over how data and empirical evidence about Aboriginal people is used. Um, case in point, and, and this kind of ties back to what I was talking about before, and one of our Indigenous Data Network's main projects is a community data project, because if you've heard of a thing called Close the Gap, or Closing the Gap, I should say, it's a national report on a multitude of indicators. I think currently there's, they've revamped it or done a refresh. And they talked, they went and um, uh, talked to the Aboriginal people in communities, community organisations, um, and, and across all different sectors and said, well, what's the problem with the close the gap? Well, the first thing is the gap isn't closing. And the second thing is the indicators that they're using are mostly derived from administrative data sets that are not under the control of Aboriginal people. They were, the capture systems weren't defined by Aboriginal people. And I'll give you an example. Um, when I first went to the department, I worked on a report called Kuri Health Counts. Now, we've had Aboriginal people working in hospitals since the mid 70s. They're called Aboriginal Hospital Liaison Officers. They might be called AHOs, AHLOs. Or, um, but what those Aboriginal people there do is they help navigate a system that was never designed for them. And we know that you know, historically, in a lot of cases, Aboriginal people were denied services. I've heard plenty of stories of where Aboriginal people were born under a tree out the front of the hospital because they were just told, you can't come in here, okay? If you don't know anything about that, you know, you, that's the fault of the education system uh, that didn't teach us enough about that kind of stuff, but it is getting better. People are starting to learn about this stuff. So. Aboriginal people in the hospitals, what they would do is that they would keep information about the clients that they would deal with. And they would help navigate the hospital system for their clients or the Aboriginal people seeking services at tertiary level healthcare. So at a point in around the early 90s, the department here in Victoria, Department um, of Health, decided that they wanted to start to keep track of how many Aboriginal people were using the hospitals. By about the late 1990s, um, they decided to bring in, uh, um, not an incentive, but a, a loading. And so in Victoria, we have a devolved governance system. Um, so the hospitals aren't part of the health department. Whereas in New South Wales, hospitals are part of that department. So here in Victoria, they're all independent bodies. But we had a program called ICAP, so Improving Care for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Patients. So anytime an Aboriginal person would go into hospital, um, the hospital would be, or anytime anybody went to hospital, the way that they would fund the hospital is under what they call an activity-based funding system. And the technical term is WEIS, or Weighted Inlier Equivalent Separation. So what they realised is that Aboriginal people were arriving at the hospital with greater comorbidities. So they needed to fund that service to them to deal with their greater comorbidities. So in Victoria, we currently, well, that has been a review, but for quite a long time, since about 2004, we've had a 30% loading. So if you go in and you identify as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, the hospital would get a 30% loading, that which was meant to um, as, uh, be, be the way that, that that hospital could afford to deal with the greater comorbidities that that patient would present with. So this particular um, uh, system that they had, they had Aboriginal people counting the numbers, they had the hospital counting the numbers. And they were looking at how they how they were tracking. And what they found is at the start, the Aboriginal people that worked in hospitals were much better at identifying Aboriginal clients because the clients would come in and they would seek out the Aboriginal hospital liaison officer. So by a certain stage, they started to reach parity and then the, the, they started actually counting and they created a capture frame within it that had Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, um, both, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, neither, 
And then they would also have a couple of extra fields, or they currently have, if you look at the thing called the VAED, or Victorian Admitted Episodes Data Set, and the VEMD, so the Victorian Emergency Management um, Data Set. They have a capture frame in there, so then that um, they can you know, capture that information about the Aboriginal clients coming in. The issue is here, and there's multiple issues, is that there wasn't really standards for how you were supposed to ask that question. Now, I can tell you from personal experience when I worked on the ICAP program that um, a lot of the times I would talk to um, uh, the, the staff inside the hospital and, and quite often they would feel they wouldn't want to ask people if they're Aboriginal on Torres Strait Islander. And I, I can kind of understand it, but when you're being paid to do a job, you're meant to prompt Aboriginal people to self-identify. There are national standards that are associated with that. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in, as well. So in the early stages of my job at the department, I had to put together the report that detailed all that information about all the hospitals across Victoria. So where are all the babies being born? Um, you know, what are the kind of conditions that average people are going to hospital with? Um, what are the kind of numbers that we're looking at? Break them down into the different diagnoses groups. And that was all based upon what they call the ICD-10 codes or International Classification of Disease and Illness. So you can actually look that up historically. Those reports were done for quite a long time. So the point I'm get, trying to get at here, and I'm gonna show you, cause I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and I've got a presentation here, which I'm gonna show you. Um, now I will, I'm gonna share my screen because I'm going to, whoop, I shouldn't, didn't wanna show you that bit, <laughs> but you got to see it anyway. Okay, so if we go back to this little bit here. The issue I'm trying to get at here is identification of Aboriginal people in data sets. How reliable is it? Because this is like a key plank of creating accurate and reliable data ecosystems. Because if the data isn't right before it goes in there, you're, you're analyzing and, and doing statistical analysis on data that doesn't quite tell the story. And this is a big problem with administrative data sets, hence the reason why I was talking about closing the gap and those reports. So you can see in 2017, it was 50 years since the 1967 referendum. And, um, you know, just to clarify something, the Aboriginal people were not classified as flora and fauna. Okay, they weren't classified, but there was a, an association there that you can look that stuff up. I just want to um, clear that up. But, we're about to have the census, the 2021 census. Now it's 50 years since that first little data frame, capture frame was included in the census because the 1967 uh, referendum, one of the, um, uh, the things that it brought about was Aboriginal people were then formally included in the census for the first time. Aboriginal people had been included in independent census state-based you know, way back in the 1850s, 1860s, you know, you'd have to do a lot of searching to find that information. But they were never formally collected Australia-wide as a national body. So what you can see here is, is that, you know, there were special collectors, there's been, um, you know, several um, improvements over the years to try and improve how we collect data about Aboriginal people and how we make it accurate. Now, we know for a fact that between the 2011 and 2016 census, just here in Victoria alone, the indigenous population increased by 26%. Now, I'm just gonna clarify something for you. You might hear me using the term Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, indigenous. I, I, I use those words for other people's benefits. I don't use those words when I'm around Aboriginal people. I might say blackfellas, or I might say, who's your mob? And where you're from and then i identify i let them i self-identify tell me where they're from there's no question in the census that says who's your mob what's your language group that's that's where i'm getting back to if aboriginal people define the capture systems the ecosystem will end up different and it will end up in a way that it reflects the way that us aboriginal people would collect data and that goes back to the administrative data sets that we can look at and we can see problems with them. So what would happen if Aboriginal people define or designed the census that collected information about Aboriginal people? We would ask a lot of different questions. And so the subsequent analysis, data visualization and business intelligence development 
would look different. And I'm pretty sure it would. So, and I think I'm kind of qualified to kind of make that statement. So, you can go and have a look, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, who I'm actually going to be in a six hour workshop with tomorrow um, as uh, on their data advisory group. Um, they've got some um, best practice guidelines, which you can all look up. And really, it's about self identification. Unlike in, let's say, for instance, Canada, you can get legal status as. First Nations, Métis, and I can't remember the other one. But you can get legal status and it's on your driver's license. Here in Australia, it's all about self-identification. And trust me when I say this, there's times when I haven't want people to know that I'm Aboriginal because I know their behaviour changes, okay? And you just have to take my word on it. As a 52-year-old Aboriginal man in this country, um, I've seen the way that Aboriginal people are treated and sometimes I just want people to think, I'm Italian and I worked in an Italian restaurant for eight months before they figured out I'm not Italian. All right. So just apologies. I do do stand up comedy and I talk a bit of, bit of comedy because some, this is quite traumatizing for me can be sometimes when I talk about it because I don't get to escape and take my code of Aboriginality off at the end of the day. This is always with me 24 hours a day. So this is the, the, the way that, you know, the, the statistical data is collected by the ABS. If you haven't seen it, the ASGS. And you can see right there in the middle, the orange squares, you know, indigenous regions, areas, and locations. Now, those delineations of areas are purely for statistical comparative purposes. They're not defined. They don't tell you how many Yorta Yorta people there are. They don't tell you how many um, Kolkata people or Yongle people or, you know, Nadinjiri people. And then I go, how many Nadinjiri people are employed? You can't find that information anywhere, okay? And so that's another part of how we can change the, the, the eventual or resultant ecosystem if we both change the capture system and some of the geometry that we use, the, you know, the area delineations, if you like. So, that's what it looks like if you look at the Aboriginal population um, of Australia and it shows you the different areas. And you can see there's a high concentration of Aboriginal population across the Eastern Seaboard, despite what people think that you have to go out back to see a black fella, which is simply not true. So here's what I was getting at before. So you can see that this is the ASGS and it shows us the Greater Shepparton area. And it's an administrative boundary. It doesn't correlate to the area that Yorta Yorta people recognize as the country they come from. All of you guys might have seen uh, recently, there was a campaign by Australia Post. Um, actually, there's a, a, an Aboriginal woman who I met um, when I was over in Perth earlier this year, who instigated that um, campaign. So that when you are sending a letter to someone, it'll include in saying, I'm sending this letter from Wurundjeri country. And if I'm sending it to Adla someone in Adelaide, I'm sending it to Ghana country. So then people start to get used to saying they know whose country they're on, okay? And it's all our country, but we do realize there are traditional owners, okay? Um, so that gives you an idea. Now, here's one of the other problems if we start to look at the geometry that currently exists that relates to those area delineations. So you can see the map on the left is the really popular, that's the Horton map. It's commonly known as the Aboriginal language, languages map, but a guy called Horton created two big um, volumes um, and he kind of, he used the map on the right, this one over here on the right hand side, this is the Tyndale map. So Norman Tyndale was an anthropologist, travelled around Australia um, and he collected all this information about um, languages, language groups, people and tribes. Now, I was fortunate enough to actually have seen the actual books, the big green, you know, the big old green ledger books and the massive books. Um, I was lucky enough to have seen them um, back in the 90s. So that map on the right is created, is based on his um, collection. And then the map on the left, um, you can see, is the, the modern interpretation done by Horton. And it's probably the most common and popular one that most people see. And yeah. What you can see is the area that I've circled, you can see that the Arenti people, there's multiple sub languages or dialects, if you like, and that happens right across the country. You can see a lot of them are grouped up and grouped together. So that's, um, you know, this is a bit of, that's another issue itself. That has to be corrected. There are lots of projects 
I'm currently uh, working with a, a digital solutions company in WA called Winyama Digital Solutions, Aboriginal owned and run business <coughs> to look at addressing this Aboriginal traditional place names. And it's not just about the language areas, it's about you know locations and, and the recognition of how people interact with the country. So that's more of the traditional older stuff uh, or the you know the language based stuff. Here, what we're doing is I'm looking at, I generated some stuff for um, a, a data visualization that we were working on. So we can also do things. And as you can see, I've got three different colored areas on this map and they're called isochrones. So we've got a five minute, 10 minute and 15 minute drive zone catchments. Over top of that, we've got a location of all health services that are located on the map. And the little red um, dot at the top is Wadawurrung Aboriginal Co-op, and this is a, you may recognize this as the Geelong region. So although Aboriginal people, we want that, that recognition of country, you know, a lot of us that work in, live in um, urban centers and even remote centers and regional centers, we also want to use modern technology to look at service delivery for Aboriginal people too. Because it's not just about recognizing country, it's about delivering good services to people as well. And so I work with um, a lot of different groups to give them advice on how they can tap into different technology. Um, things like Tableau, ClickSense, Power BI, you know, ArcGIS, uh, QGIS, R, Python, those kinds of pieces of software that you can use to generate these kinds of visual representations of where Aboriginal services are and where their, um, their client base is and, and how they can shift and change their services. So we're, 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 you know, there's a lot of different reasons why we're using this. This is another example of different delineations. This comes from the National Native Title Service. So you can go and have a look at the um, ATNS website. So the, um, the, the Agreements, Treaties and National Services, um, National Title Services. It's a website that's maintained by IAPSIS, so the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. So again, this is another one. So you can see the layer list on the, on the right hand side. We've got um, you know, uh, registered native title bodies, we've got indigenous land use agreements, we've got native title determination outcomes. A lot of that information is becoming more and more publicly available um, where it's okay for it to be made publicly available. So obviously all the native title stuff goes through the courts so it has to be publicly available. So you can go in there and you can access feature layers that can be consumed by lots of different data visualization software. Um, and that's just an example of what it looks like there. So what we're doing at Melbourne Uni is we're talking to people about, you know, building these ecosystems where you use, you know, virtual machines, you can use data sets that feed into those virtual machines. And then we can look at trying to get, um, you know, any kind of map based or analytics based web interfaces. So that's just a bit of an example of it there. Um, and this one just gives you an example of what a, a, a data ecosystem could look like. Just a, a very, very basic example. So you can see down the bottom right hand corner, we can use geographic information systems. So I'm sure that if any of you have seen a web map or a map in a website, it's likely either ArcGIS, Mapbox, Leaflet, or one of those um, pieces of software that has that capability. Now, R is not a GIS software, but you can use um, you can use GG Map, you can use Leaflet. There's a whole heap of other things you can get. Mapbox API keys that can work with it as well. Um, and then, you know, there's all these different uh, data visualization softwares that you can use. So Plotly, Click GI Analytics, Power BI can do mapping capability. Uh, FileMaker Pro can as well. So you can see that this is kind of a little bit of a very basic um, you know, way that we can get all these different pieces of software to perform different roles to generate that final picture that your end user gets to see. And that's really, I didn't coin the term down the bottom, so I'm not taking credit for that. So if you think about computationally intensive ensemble data modeling techniques, basically means that if you want to create you know, a bar chart, you'd probably use Plotly. If you want a bar chart and it, the bar chart shows you COVID cases per state in Australia, you might want to see a map next to it and you might use um, Leaflet or you might use ArcGIS or QGIS. Getting those to work together 
that run off a data model in the background. So if you click on one, the other one activates as well. So I'll give you a bit of an example of how that works in a second. Um, but that, that just kind of gives you an idea of what I mean and what I'm kind of getting at by a data ecosystem. So, um, and that may be a simple thing that most people um, understand. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there for a second. Now, I don't, I just want to know if anybody has any questions at this point in time, um, more than happy to, um, if uh, either Ben or Emmy want to um, narrate the, or, or moderate the um, chat area, so if people want to chuck the questions in there, or put their hand up and ask a question. Otherwise, I'll just keep going along with my presentation. So, as you can notice, I can talk underwater, um, <laughs> and will if you let me, all right? So, um, so that, when we're talking about some of those- Darren. Darren. Yep. Uh, Karen's got a question, yeah. Yep, yep, go for it, go for it. Hi Darren, thanks for this. Sorry, I'm just very, very excited about all of your work. Um, and so I just had a couple of questions about how you're using the um, Indigenous boundaries. So I've been doing some work with Luke Birchall, who's um, an Aboriginal cardiologist. Um, and we were trying to, again, some of the challenges you're talking about, like dealing with the VED and the VEMD and seeing how reliable the um, Aboriginal um, classification is. And you're absolutely right. Um, if we were chatting to the Aboriginal liaison officers and um, we were um, finding that of course they were telling us there was so much misclassification going on so how reliable is this when we're trying to use it in research because what we're trying to do is feedback to community and give information about risk models for cardiovascular events um, but you're absolutely speaking my language because look and I've had a, a big chat about how useful the mapping we've been doing about cardiovascular events is for community because we have been using you know your traditional um SE2s and your postcodes and all that kind of stuff and so I'm just I'm just really fascinated in all the stuff you're doing and interested in how um how you use the maps with community and how how you're finding even um at the kind of government level as well potentially how how this information is being used because it's something that I think is so important to do. And um, we just were I, I, I fascinated in how you're doing all of this because it's just something that I've, I've dabbled in GIS stuff, but um, it's great to see all this interactive work. Sorry, I've got so many questions, but I'll, I'll stop talking. But um, yeah, just how, how are you using these boundaries and what, what kind of problems is it helping solve? Yeah, um, yeah, look, thank you for that comment, Karen. And, and yeah, as I said, I, I I, I, I really enjoyed working in the hospital sector, but it still infuriated me and frustrated me. But, you know, I, I loved having access to those data sets. They were really amazing. And, you know, even looking at, you know, those two indicators, because there is no indicator that you can use to measure the cultural safety of a hospital. So we had to use pseudo indicators, discharge against medical advice, and, and did, not, um, did not wait in ED. And yet they're, they're like pseudo indicators because if someone leaves, it doesn't necessarily mean the, the hospital is culturally unsafe for them, but it could. But quite often, if you look at, you know, say Viner, which is the non-admitted area, Aboriginal people might be told, okay, you have a, come in and have an operation, which is where the only place you can have this. But then, you know, once you're discharged, you can, you need to come back for a follow-up. But if they have an Aboriginal community control organisation, health organisation that delivers the same follow-up care or the same type of care, they would rather go there and get deal with Aboriginal people than go back to the hospital and deal with non-Aboriginal people. And yet the hospital system doesn't capture that. Mm. They won't sit there and say, well, that actually is more culturally safe for this Aboriginal person than that hospital's day, um, day surgery unit. Nothing wrong with it. But then again, we have heard plenty of situations. And I personally heard of one situation where an Aboriginal man had worked a 12 hour shift, gone in, and he's gone into, his partner's about to give birth, and his partner, the child got a child protection notification because they thought the father was drunk. He wasn't, he was just exhausted from work. But that assumption of alcoholism in the Aboriginal community, and trust me, I've caught that plenty of times myself. We don't have those capture systems that measure that kind of stuff. Even the VES, the Victorian Healthcare Experience Survey, you can look at it and you can look up Aboriginal status, but you can't look up 
what the Aboriginal person said about their experience other than all the clinical questions and, you know, the standard questions that everybody else get asked. Do you know what I mean? So um, if you think the other stuff was pretty cool to look at, I'm, you're probably going to lose your mind in a second because I'm going to show you some other stuff. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, We've got a question from Kai, but do you want to keep going and answer it later? No, no, no I'll stop here because I've got. I'm going to switch again, switch tactic again a little bit. So, okay, no, Kai, no. did you want to? Do you want me to read it out, or did you want to verbally ask a question? I see what your hand raised. I'll read it out for you. Um, okay, Kai says. Uh, I worked in the Kimberley back in the 90s for many years. Even back then, they had a team of coders collecting data for hospital admissions, but the data is rarely accurate due to clinician perception of data and associated admin tasks. Is the solution immediate feedback of data and demonstrating relevance across all groups as per your talk? How well are such systems implemented? The ICD system is poorly used in general. I feel the data collection has a low priority for all health professionals. Um... Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't criticise, I, I mean, look, I, I got to see the minimum data set that came to the department. So I didn't get to see the full gamut of data that's collected inside individual hospitals. But I did for probably about six years go to the Trade University and I would present to their health information management students. And I always talk to them and say, look, this is the, the complexity this is the, the benefit of working with Aboriginal Health Branch inside the department, and you get access to that BAD, BMD, Vina, and several other data sets. And it was about promoting that. So when they went back to the hospital, then they could think about improving those kinds of things. So I wouldn't speak about the whole VAD as a whole, but I do, I have seen some um, stuff in there where I, I see that it doesn't really reflect the reality. And that's probably not just towards Aboriginal people, Aboriginal status, you know, the experience of Aboriginal people. So I agree with what he's saying. Um, you know, even if you look at a thing like ACSC, so ambulatory care sensitive conditions, we've got a big problem where we don't have Medicare talk to hospital data. And yet that the ACSC is meant to be a measure of when the primary healthcare sector fails someone. And instead of having ambulatory care in the community, it ends up in hospital. And it's either you know chronic, acute, or vaccine preventable. That's the code set under the ICD um, code list that's put together nationally. And most states will measure this because it's, a, as I say, it's a measure of if we can reduce ICD in tertiary, it means that we're actually saving money because dealing with patients in tertiary is more expensive than dealing with them in primary care settings. And so that's going to be really, really obvious. And I'm going to give a plug here because I'm going to talk about it afterwards. Um, about a project that we're going to try and run later in the year. I've been talking to Ben about this called a Black Hackathon, where we want to look at the impact of um, the impact of COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic, and the subsequent lockdowns on Aboriginal young people aged 10 to 25. And the things that you talk about, Ben, means that we really need to be aware of the problems with that when we write up the research that we're going to do. So we're going to look at you know, admissions, um, we're going to look at uh, presentations, we're going to look at clinical and community mental health, and look at young Aboriginal people. Did they, was there a rush to go to ED for, you know, alcohol-related presentations or self-harm or mental and behavioural disorders? And were they admitted to a bed? Did they switch go from ED? Were they admitted to a bed? Did that hospital have capacity? Did they have beds that were specifically considered culturally appropriate for Aboriginal young people? Well, those are the, some of the questions that we're hoping to kind of explore later in the year. But again, you know, the point is well made. Um, sometimes the data is not used in, you know, ways that it should. But I mean, that's probably all I can really say on that topic. Um, but yeah, that's, I hope that answers the question. But um, yeah, you and me, we, I, I spent many years looking at those ICD-10 books and looking at the VAD and VMD, and I could see, you know, data doesn't, data is, you know, that still data is only our attempt to reflect the real world and what happens in the real world. And there's always that, you know, lack of, in, you know, real robust and, and proper interpretation. So um, I'd love to have, have it be a better source, but we'll have to deal with what we've got. So I might move on here because I know I don't have much time left. 
Um, and Karen, this is probably something that you um, find interesting. When I talk about, you know, this computational intensive stuff, I will run a piece of software called ClickSense, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a look at what it looks like. Oh, it's logged me out again, hasn't it? Okay. Um, as I said, Power BI is probably a really, really well-known um, data visualization software. Tableau is another really well-known one. The one that I use is called ClickSense. So what I'm going to do is show you here is that this is the Aboriginal language map, and I'm going to show you three different versions of the same data, but we're using I'm using different software each time. So what you can see here is that if I zoom in on the map and I go over here and I'll look at this area here and I click on that one there, you can see that I've got it says Bardi Maya, so B A D I M A Y A. So Bardi it means us people and Maya means home. So I said to you followers before, I'm a storyteller. Um, I'm just wondering how many of you followers have heard of a place called Monkey Maya? It's right over here in Western Australia. So if I go here, you can see there's a place on the map called Denham. I'll zoom in, you can see it right there. And on here, if I zoom in a little bit more, you'll see there's another group here and there's Monkey Maya. Okay, so Monkey Maya is world famous. People go there from all over the world because it's one of the few places in the world where you can interact with wild dolphins. The dolphins will come in and they'll come up to the beach to be fed. Um, they've got rangers there and they'll now protect them and stop the tourists from um, harming the dolphins. But Maya means home of. So uh, you'll probably find this a bit funny, I hope it's appropriate, but in our word, it, there's a word in WA that if we refer to poo, it's called guna. So if I say guna maya, that means the toilet. Okay, so if you ever have a black belt come up to you in WA and look at you quizzically and go, guna maya, they're asking where the toilet is. Okay, so maya actually means home of. So my people are called Bari maya. So the place where I'm from means home of our people. So if I zoom back out again, you can see that there's a place here called, um, right there is a place called Lake Moor. Um, and right up above that, directly above that, is another location. So this is the home of the Buddy Maya people. So you've got different language codes. There's Buddy Maya Witty. So I've got all these language codes. You can see there's three locations there. So that's a map that shows us all these language locations. So this is a data visualization software. Now, I've got some more complex ones, but I'm not going to try and run them because <clears throat> I'm running them off a cloud-based service, which doesn't give very uh, good um, processing power. I'm just using a free service at the moment. This is a free publicly available um, data set from the IAXIS website, so anybody can go there and look it up. So what I'll do is I'm going to switch over to a piece of software called ClickSense. So what I'll do is again, I'll show you the same again. I'm using, I've got all these different layers, so I can turn them all off and on. So if I go to, let's say I go to this one, you're looking at exactly the same data set. So these are language locations. I've just told it I want to use an SVG or a scalable vector graphics icon of the Aboriginal flag. Okay, so you can see as I scale in, it's an SVG, so it will automatically react to my scaling. So what I can do is, if I didn't want to look at it that way, and I wanted to look at, you know, concentration of languages, I can click on this one. And now you can see there's a concentration of languages up here with here. So if I was to, you know, apply a different uh, way of looking at that, I can see these are the language areas that we were looking at before. Um, and if I go to the Tyndale map, I'll just turn that one off for a sec. Okay, and that one. And you can see I can look at exactly the same data again. If I click on that area, you can see I've got, it says Bari Maya. So this is just a slight different interpretation because the English way of spelling Aboriginal words varies wildly, quite wildly. But in essence, it's exactly the same people, buddy my people. That's how we would say it anyway. But here it's spelt Bari my. So again, another data issue. But it is the same data. So how would we build that? If I look at this map, you can see all the different areas on the map. And if I click on a particular area, it will say this is the Walpuri people. If anybody Barrett's from Melbourne remembers a, um, a bloke called Liam Jara took mark of the year. Um, he was, they used to call him the Walpuri wizard. 
because that's his country, that's where he was from. Okay, so again, I can also layer over top of that the Aboriginal population. So I'll just turn that Tyndale map off. So you can see that this is the Aboriginal population. So if I click on that particular area here, I can scroll down and go, well, there's a total of um, 4,959 Aboriginal people living in that area, according to the 2016 census. But those areas don't match these areas. All right, so I'd have to do a bit of fancy um, intersecting, which is a, a, you know, a geographical technique that you can use in ArcGIS. Um, but how, do we, how would we do that on the fly? Well, that's where we'd have to build some, you know, that, that thing I was talking about before, that computationally intensive ensemble, where each particular piece of software performs a different role. You don't want to load in all these polygons because it'll make your, whatever data visualization you're using wouldn't be very agile. So that's a way that we're trying to get to the thing that Karen was talking, asking about before. How would we use these language maps? How would we use them with modern statistical standards? Well, that's a question that we're trying to crack um, and look at, but you know, it'll be working with groups like Winyama and WA, the Barang Alliance in New South Wales that I'm doing some data visualization work with, um, to talk to them and say, well, how would you use it? And then I'll just be able to provide technical skills and ability to help them. So then they determine how data about them is being used. That's really what that Indigenous data sovereignty is about. So you can see that um, my last little one, and I know that we're getting close because we're at um, quarter two. So the last little one I'm gonna show you is um, if I was to do, this is QGIS. Now, a lot of Aboriginal organizations wouldn't be able to afford licenses for ArcGIS. So I can also talk to them about using things like open source software. So, you know, R, Python, and this is QGIS, which is an open source GIS software. So what you can see here is I'm just using a very simple tool that aggregates them. And you saw before, when I was showing this map, when I show the density, it shows it as a heat, as kernel density estimation, right? So I'll just turn that off. So you can see that up here, if I zoom out a little bit, you can see where those language groups are, right? If I use QGIS, instead of using a heat map, I'm using a counting system. So you can see higher numbers up here, and you can see individual dots in the middle. Sometimes they're numbered. You can see along here, they're fairly high density. If I zoom in, they suddenly become single dots or double numbers. But I can zoom back out and it interacts and it automatically tells me that there's a whole cluster of languages that were recorded in that area by Norman Tyndale. So, and again, this is a free piece of software that anybody can use and learn how to use as well. So I promote this to the Aboriginal um, people that I work with in these different groups. So last thing is this, another piece of open source, source software called Blender. Um, been around for a long time. Um, I, I've been paying for quite a while to support them because they are open source. Um, and so this is exactly the same data again. It's the Aboriginal languages locations and so i'm just going to quickly show you this now try this is just like a little bit of eye candy but it is showing you how we can get to three dimensions and we can start to make this stuff happen so this software blender it has um it has a qgis plugin so if i just go into object mode for a second you can see it's got an um a plugin called gis where you can bring in open street maps you can have base maps you can get elevation data, you can import shape maps, um, you can import different types of um, data, you can export them, change them to different things. So what I'm gonna do, I'll go back to edit mode so you can just see those locations. So again, they're all the locations, and then we can start to animate them because this is 3D animation software. Um, and I'll just show you. So there you go. We're looking at all the different language locations recorded by Norman Tindale that I showed you originally. And there you go. And I'll finish up on that point because that was pretty much most of what I wanted to show you. So if we have any other questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. So. So Darren, actually, I have a question. Um, just with the ClickSense one, you showed us the population size based on the SA2. Is So the the per tribe one, that, that one, the population is mapped from SA2 2016 census? 
Yes. So, uh, so uh, what about the SA1? Because SA1 is smaller. So would that be like a smaller than the actual um, tribal region? Yeah, it definitely would be, um, but it depends because the, the more um, regional or remote you get, the larger those become because each of those areas have to have a population range that's equal to all the others. So an SA2 has to have a, an equal population range, not number, but range to every other SA2. Otherwise, they're not statistically comparative. Mm. So I, what I would do is I would go down to mesh block level and use that if it was just talking about population. But you need a computer that is really computationally powerful to be able to handle mesh blocks across Australia. I mean, there's 52,000, I think, mesh blocks just in Victoria alone. And the processing power needed, especially when you start dealing with polygon data, um, can be very, um, yeah, very, very resource hungry. But yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. And yeah, that, that's the way I would go to the lowest um, geographical granularity, which is mesh blocks, and then work up from there and go mesh blocks, SA1, SA2, SA3, SA4. But yeah, they could be fit into that. And, and also you can use population weighted centroids as well for that mesh blocks. Mm. I'm curious whether you know for the upcoming census, which I actually happen to have just completed today, um, do, do you know whether what they are doing in terms of the, um, when they release the data, or whether that this is going to still have be based on SA1, SA2 as previously defined? Um, what happens is that um, they'll still go by the ASGS. Um, they don't generally release mesh blocks unless you go into their microdata environment, but obviously you have to apply to get access to that. Um, and the majority of their data is released at SA2 level, uh, simply because the numbers get too small and they start to have to randomize the data and then you'll get cells where there's, it'll say, okay, there's, the numbers just can't be uh, shown for these areas. And that's even more so when you're talking about the Aboriginal population, um, because you can't get too granular with the data, you just don't have it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, no, they'll, as far as I'm aware, they, they'll always bring out a new version of the ASGS because as you, I don't know how many of you remember um, one of the minister called Matthew Guy, um, way back in, I think it was 2008, nine or 10, um, increased the greater metropolitan boundary. So some of those bigger SA2s, so SA3s around the boundary of Melbourne, because the population was moving out there, they had to break them up. And, and then suddenly an SA3 got broken up into more um, smaller areas of, um, and then, you know, since population growth will change, it won't change the structure, but it changes the numbers of SA2s and SA1s. And it just means, you, you know, you get a more concentrated population, you have to have smaller areas to, to maintain that population range. Mm. Um, so Fiona, if you'd like to unmute and ask a question, um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Hi, how are you? Um, I really wanted to congratulate you. That was such an excellent seminar. And um, I guess my comment is that often in statistics, um, I've been advised that things have to be very simple for policymakers to respond. It has to be very, very simple quest, um, simple presentation, whereas this just absolutely turns it on its head where you can visualize all these details and um, really show the complexity in a way that people can engage with. And um, I've never seen anything quite like it, actually. Um, I just wondered if you had any comments about how um, decision makers are responding to actually being able to see data in this kind of way. Um, it's funny that you should ask that because I did a lot of work in the Department of Health working in um, business intelligence development. So I worked on multiple pro projects. So I worked on the medically supervised injecting room um, and I, I received data from Ambulance Victoria. And this is where um, data went from its raw form with um, Ambulance Victoria. We collect the data, latitude and longitude, and they gave us the data for call outs where there were um, overdoses and naloxone was delivered to the person that they were called out to see because naloxone is associated with opioid overdoses. So what we had to do was map the 18 months before the medically supervised injecting room in North Richmond opened and the 18 months afterwards to see if we could visually see a change in 
the concentration of ambulance call-outs. And it was clear that you could see that. You can see it, it's in the 203 page report that's been made publicly available. And that has now supported the um, decision to open a second injecting room. So that, that was one area where we took that data and we really made a, you know, a strong case for a policy change. Mm -hmm. um, another, another case where that I worked on also was mapping out um, where GPs were signing up for the Safe Scripts program. So, you know, uh, following on from the opioid um, problem that they've had in the United States, we started to see some of it in, in Victoria. Um, our department was um, given 12 months worth of Medicare data. Now, um, I, I mapped out that data as well. And what we could see is where clients were started to create this wagon wheel around them where they were getting their prescriptions from, which meant they were doctor shopping. And so they were trying to avoid this doctor knowing that they'll get an opioids from mm. that doctor. That's how kind of these things can start. And so we had the Safe Scripts program, which is where they encourage GPs to sign up for monitoring of opioid um, prescriptions. So we could see if an opioid crisis was coming. And, and it became very obvious that that kind of policy pressure and the GPs were now being made to realize, hang on, we're watching you. We can see whether you're signing up or not. And that kind of created a bit of a change as well. <coughs> can't say for certain it's been a highly successful one but again it's another example of where that raw data gets used in it and it gets visualized and it can be used in policy change um you know mm. for the benefit of the the, the public uh, and there's a multi there's a whole heap of other examples i could give you but they're probably the two i could think of the top of my head mm. but yeah yeah that that's amazing um particularly in those areas where um so much um of the thinking is biased and incorrect to actually be able to bring the real data and that real evidence in a way that people can um, engage with it properly. That, that's brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and you know, probably one more topical one I'd talk about is if you look at the early maps that the Department of Health were creating here in Victoria, you saw most of the hot spots for COVID cases were in the eastern suburbs. And then as time progressed, it kind of moved out into the lower socioeconomic areas where people who work in the service industry, service sectors, that started to become the hotspots because they were going and serving the other people that were able to come overseas. And that's where all the cases came from. And, and you know, the wealthier you are, the more you can afford to fly overseas. And, and, and they brought it back and kind of passed it on. And I won't get into that because I'll, um, I'll have very strong opinions on it. But you can see the similar kind of thing happening in Sydney, where the outbreak started in the richer eastern suburbs, and it's now moved into those western suburbs where the people who work in, you know, those, um, you know, uh, service sector areas were picking it up from the areas that they worked in, taking it back to the areas that they lived in. And the maps show that quite clearly. I had a reminder to, did you, you want to tell us more about the Black Hackathon? You mentioned it earlier. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I've been talking to Ben. Um, so we, we're um, in, in the process of uh, um, organizing an event called Black Hackathon. So the idea is, and as I said before, we want to look at, you know, that, that period of time between 2000, uh, April 2019 through to, uh, April 2021. So we've captured that period of the lockdown and we're looking at the impact of um, the, the COVID lockdowns on Aboriginal young people aged 10 to 15. So we're trying, we're going to be in the process fairly soon of recruiting people to uh, participate. It's going to be um, like a two day event where on the, the first day we'd have all our participants to come in that were either volunteers or participants in the project. Now, the premise of this is we have a real lack of Aboriginal people who work in this space and do the kind of work that I do or the kind of work that you fellows do as well. Um, but we also have a lot of Aboriginal people who, um, we would want to see the data literacy skills um, brought up, uh, lifted up so then they can um, better utilize the data that they have for service delivery. So in Victoria, we have you know, the Aboriginal Community Control Health Sector and their peak body is VATCHO, so the Victorian Aboriginal Community Control Health Organization. They have about 31 or 32 members, I think it is, and about 24 of those deliver health specific services or have a, um, a GP, um, uh, service. Now, what we've noticed is that we, um, uh, we, we, you know, 
one of the things I've been asked quite regularly over a long period of time is, you know, what are the kinds of things that we can do with our data? And it's not just the Aboriginal sector that's asked these kinds of questions. So in this particular case, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get more Aboriginal people into STEM and through the data kind of area. So we know that um, there's a big push to get more, um, more female or women into STEM areas, and particularly women from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, more diverse backgrounds as well. So, you know, thinking about that, there's a push for that. What I'd like to do is see a lot more Aboriginal people become, not, not become statisticians, and no offence to everybody, but add statistical capabilities to their toolbox. And my dad always used to say to me, a toolbox with one tool in it is useless. You've got to have multiple tools to your toolbox. And as you can see, come the kind of tools that I use, I'll use a lot of different tools. So what we want to do is be able to invite Aboriginal people to come along, um, form groups, and we want Aboriginal people to ask the question of the data. And then we want analysts to provide the statistical grant, so to speak, but not ask the questions. And what we'll see is we'll probably get this cross-pollination going on. Whereas Aboriginal people who probably never felt you know, like that space was a space where they wanted to go into or they felt really culturally safe to go into. Um, they'll have that experience of being able to um, talk to analysts and watch what they do, might be able to pick up some terminology, you know, start to understand the vernacular associated with data analysis, data management, those kinds of things. And we we'll also get analysts who may not have had the opportunity to hear and listen to how Aboriginal people would interrogate data. What questions would they ask about it? And it's their lived experience that would change the way that they approach the data. And I can tell you that from personal experience. So the event is we want to have um, a couple of sessions on one day where we get, we set up virtual machines. So I've been working with the Center for Victorian Data Linkage. We're going to be looking at their um, integrated data resource, which is basically a linkage map. And they've got, I think last count, there's about 34 data sets in there. So the VAD and VMD is in there. Um, we can also look at mental health and the um, clinical and community mental health. So that, that pathway I was talking about before, you know, young Aboriginal person experiences lockdown, um, may experience, you know, mental behavioural disorders when they present to an ED. Are they then admitted to a mental health bed? Are they then supported by clinical or community mental health? Because it's never a linear line. It's always a circle like this. You know, readmissions, readmissions, those kinds of things. Um, I can speak from personal experience because I've had a lot of that going on in my family. So our event is we want Aboriginal people to ask the question. We want the analysts to provide the grant. But we want this to be a, um, a series of events over a you know, three-year period because the first time what we're doing is establishing access to the virtual machines, getting the Aboriginal people in the groups to make them feel comfortable, getting the analysts to sit in the room and listen to the Aboriginal people. And again, like I said, you'll get that cross-pollination. Um, and this is an event where for a long, long time, the administrative data held by government agencies has not been made available to Aboriginal people who can use that data to make um, more evidence-informed decision-making when it comes to service delivery. So you can kind of see what I was getting back to talking about service delivery and those kinds of things. And then they can look at different data things and they will immediately eyeball it and look at it and go, oh, that doesn't make sense because there's a lot more going on in our community than that data tells us. And that's kind of goes back to what the issues that um, was raised before about the VAD and VMD. So this is an event we're like, where we're planning to have it in late November. So we're looking, um, you know, I've been speaking to Ben about uh, recruiting analysts who would like to be involved in the project. And as I said, it'll be a two day event we're going to be looking at one, um, one, uh, one weekend where we get people to have a look at the data, they can eyeball it, and then they can have a week to think about it, start to formulate the questions, and then they get to visualize the data and use some of the techniques that I've used to eyeball the data. Now, this is not an analysis um, project. It's, it's an event to go, let's get those two groups in the, in the room and let's see what happens. And then when they spot something that may be of interest or they think they want further analysis, they'll have to do their own ethics approval and their own application to CBDL to get access to the data. But as we've already walked that path, ethics, risk assessment, negotiating CBDL, establishing virtual machine access, 
we will have already walked the path that they're going to walk themselves and when we can walk them through it on their next attempt. So that's kind of a premise of the event that we're looking to run. So we're hoping to get people to put their hand up and um, potentially be part of it and you get access and have a look at some linked data. So, and, and you know, very large data set. So. so if people wanted to be involved or just get more updates on what's happening, what's the best way? Uh, well, they can certainly contact you, Ben. Um, you've got my um, details. We will be advertising it fairly soon. I'm just, we're currently in the process of getting our ethics approval through University of Melbourne. Uh, once that's approved, then I can start recruiting people. Um, and we'll probably, we'll, what we'll do is we'll have a registry um, and we want to have people say, tell us what skills um, they've got. So, you know, when we set up the virtual machines, it'll be a sandbox environment, a secure environment, and then we need to dictate the flavors of it. So if we've got heaps of people who want to use R or Python, we'll make sure R or Python is available in the sandbox. You know, if, you're, <laughs> if you prefer Stata or SAS or SPSS, um, then we'll make sure that that's available. So there'll be a bit of a matching, skill matching to um, our virtual machine environments as well. But that's something that we'll have to set up the Centre for Victorian Data Linkage. Um, but what I'll do is once um, I'm able to start recruiting, I'll then pass on, uh, make sure that Ben's got my details. So anybody wants to put their hand up, we'll create a registry of volunteers of people that want to help. Cool. So I guess when that information is available, that registry, I'll, um, we can send it out to the members that we have in Victoria. Yep. Yep. I'll make sure that you get those details. I'll stay in contact with you, Ben, and we'll cool. certainly let you know once we're able to do that and start taking names. Thanks, Darren. Oh, thank you very much for your talk, Darren. Um, and certainly, um, everyone, please watch your space um, as we hear about more details about the Black Hackathon. And we also have a comment um, from Dina said that um, she says that it's a fantastic way of breaking the barriers to entry, which I totally agree. Um, amazing and happy to be involved. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate you putting up with listening to me talk. And uh, I, I know I'm a bit, can be a bit mad, like a mad scientist, but um, yeah, it's, it's being able to connect groups of people like yourselves with the Aboriginal sector as well. Um, it, yeah, and I totally agree, it's a fantastic way of approaching it. Um, and hopefully we have a really big event and it becomes a yearly event on the calendar. But again, thank you for letting me present to your wonderful group of people here today as well. Thank you very much for coming and presenting, Darren. Um, please, everybody, if you could give a hand to um, Darren.